Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Philip already said, my name is David Zalewski, and uh, uh, I will be talking today about how to pass and how to return. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the whole talk is more of a free exploration of how compilers see the objects uh, and how they pass them uh, in between different functions, whether it's uh, passing as an argument or whether it's returning from a function. Uh, the talk is also about how we as programmers uh, could use those insights or how we can use the knowledge that uh, comes with, uh, with the knowledge of how compilers work uh, to program better uh, and to optimize the code a bit better. So it's a fairly technical talk. Uh, it's going to be a lot uh, about compilers, about uh, the memory organization, about the ABIs. Uh, for this talk, uh, I used a couple of compilers. So I used the three major, actually four major compilers on the market. Uh, all of them in the 64-bit architecture uh, uh, compiled uh, for x86, so for the Intel architecture. GCC, Clank, and ICC uh, running on Linux, and uh, Microsoft, Microsoft compiler uh, compiling for Windows and for uh, Windows 64-bit architecture. And of course, I use Compiler Explorer for it. So uh, all of the examples were compiled with the maximum optimization setting and with the newest standard, with the C++20 standard in mind. Now, there are so many ways of passing to a function and returning from a function, right? Uh, you can pass by value, what's, what's called by passing by value. Uh, you can pass by reference uh, or by a, a pointer, by an R value reference. Uh, there are also constant variants of all those passing possibilities. So you can pass by a const reference, const R value reference, which doesn't make much sense, but you can do it nevertheless. And actually you can do the same with returning, right? You can return by value, by reference. Uh, you can also qualify those references or those pointers uh, to, to, to constant, whatever you want. Now, let's start with a bold statement. Everything is passed and returned by value. Uh, in reality, that's how the compilers work and that's how the computers work. Now, what's a value might differ. It's either a full binary representation of an object that you have in mind, a memory address of a binary representation of an object, commonly known as a pointer or as a reference, but under the hood, it's just a pointer. So that's an address of a binary representation. Uh, whether it's that one or another, it's always passed by value. So that's how the computers work under the hood, right? Now, before I start, uh, I have to do a small refresher on the memory model and on the ABI, uh, so we are on the same uh, board uh, when it comes to how computer works. And I'm going to start with a very simple example when you have just two functions, uh, a main function and that function. For simplicity, uh, I am talking about the System 5 ABI, so the ABI that's used uh, by Linux and Unix. Uh, everywhere, basically, a 64-bit version of it. And in this ABI, or in for these compilers uh, that work like this, or uh, long has eight bytes, uh, which is pretty important because it simplifies our thinking. So the main function declares two variables and initializes them. A and B, they are both long, so they occupy eight bits. Now, the conventional wisdom will tell us that in such a case the compiler will emit code which will put those constants on the stack uh, a and b in this order and a short disclaimer normally the stacks grow downwards but for this talk i let them go upwards because it's just more natural to think about stacks growing upwards than downwards so the compiler is going to emit code which will put those two variables a stack uh, next comes passing the arguments to the function. And to pass arguments to the function in the system 5 ABI, uh, you are going to put
put those values into the registers, into the RDI and RSI register, uh, 19 and 23 are going to get copied over there. Now, in the next step, the function is going to be called. And since it's a pretty easy function, the arguments are already there. Basically, it's going to be like, if it's super optimized, maybe two, three instructions, depending on, on how, you, uh, how well you are doing. Uh, the result of calling the function, so of adding those two numbers, will go into the RAX register uh, with the return register. So 42 is going to be stored there. And as a final step, uh, the compiler will emit code that will initialize the sum variable. And again, the sum variable will be put on the stack. So it's going to land over there. And for now, I'm ignoring printf. It's, uh, pretend it's not there. Now, that's how the conventional model works. Uh, in reality, it's going to look a bit different. So when you compile this piece of code with any kind of optimizations turned on, be it 01 or any higher, uh, the code is going to be something like this. The variables A and B are going to be initialized directly in the registers. So there will be no stack usage whatsoever. RDI and RSI are going to be in the registers. The sum function is going to be inlined and since it's inline, the addition will be just one instruction and the result will go directly to the register array x. And finally, now we have space for printf. Uh, after some shuffling of the registers, the registers will be prepared for the next function call to the printf. And uh, the number to be printed is going to be stored in the RSI. Uh, RDI will hold the address of the formatting string and array x will hold the number zero which is the number of variable arguments to the printf and the function will be called now things get more interesting when you deal with what's called oversized object so those are objects that cannot be passed through the registers because they are too big they don't fit in one or two registers and uh, on, on microsoft uh, for Windows a ABI, it's actually all the objects. The size doesn't matter. As long as it's greater than one, it cannot be split over registers. So when it's bigger, like in this case, we have a structure vector 3D, three long variables inside. So the total size is 24 bytes. Uh, and we have a function which both takes two arguments by value and returns by value. Now, the rest of the code is exactly the same as before. So I declare two variables, two vector variables, and I call the function which directly initializes uh, a sum variable in the main function. So what's the compiler going to emit this time? Now, the variables are definitely going to be stored on the stack. So v1 and v2 are going to land on the stack. There is no other way. Uh, they are too big for registers. Uh, in the next step, the compiler will create the sum variable also on the stack. And the address of the sum variable will be passed in the RDI register to the colli. So our function, our sum function, will get as its er first argument the address, the return address, actually, where it should store the result. This is what happens when this object is too big to fit in the RAS register, in the return register. So you have to basically pass the address of where the function should store the result. Next, the copies will be made of A and B uh, on the stack because those variables are going to, those arguments are going to be passed on the stacks and there are just, you know, simply copies being made. There is no other way around it. And finally, when the sum function or the sorry add function is called it's going to add both vectors a and b arguments store the result in the return object which address was passed to it by the main function and also store the result store the address of the return object in the rex register this is by convention uh, despite the fact that the caller knows where the return object is because it asked the address of it. Uh, it's the address is still basically copied and returned in the RAX register. So that's how it works, and it works very similar uh, on the Microsoft architecture. 
So this is your memory model and ABI 101 for today's talk. Uh, generally speaking, on Linux and on Unix, you can pass up to six integer or pointers arguments in registers. And you can also pass bigger objects in registers, uh, like those that are, for example, 16 bytes long, as long as they are trivial objects. On Microsoft, it's a bit less. You only have four registers, which you can use for passing arguments. The rest has to go on the stack. All the oversized objects, everything else also goes on the stack and on trivial objects. So those that have user-defined special member functions also go on the stack. You cannot pass them uh, through the registers uh, anymore. The return value always goes into the RAX register, and this is true both for System 5 and for Microsoft uh, X64. A small remark, if the object that you are returning is too big to fit into the RAX, then the return address or the address of this object is going to be passed by the caller to the callee in the first argument. So the first register in the argument, uh, let's say Q, is going to be used for the address of the returned object. And that's the end of the intro. Now let's go to, to, to the meat of the today's presentation. And we are gonna start with returning by value. Now, returning by value conceptually is quite easy, right? Uh, you have some function and it returns a value. And this is the simplest possible case, notice. So we have a return object. We are talking, uh, and a return object is something that the function returns. And it's actually initialized with what's called, what's known nowadays in C++ with a PR value. So the return object here marked with some type, it's somewhere there is initialized with a PR value. There is uh, directly uh, the argument or the object itself is part of the return statement. And further, uh, the return object of the function is used to initialize some other object, the color side, right? Now, the conventional wisdom, uh, or basically the, the mental model that you have to, that you need to have when you see something like this, the old mental model, is something like this. Uh, in the return statement, some object temporary is created. Now, later on, it's either copied or moved into the return object. And finally, when the function returns to the caller, it cop it's copied one more time uh, to initialize the object on the caller side. Now, this is the old story. It's, it's not like you know, a new discovery that it's way too many copies. Uh, there are two copies created in this scenario, uh, and this shouldn't be the case. And already years ago, there were compilers which could optimize those copies away. This is a piece from uh, Michael Timon uh, from uh, the 90s, where he already mentioned that at least two compilers that he then knew, one of them being Cfront, uh, the other one, GNU C++, could optimize away the copies. Uh, so they could basically realize uh, that the temporal shouldn't be there and place the newly created object directly at the address that was passed to them by the caller. So something that you've already seen uh, on, on some slides previously. Uh, now the trick was, uh, as uh, mentioned by Scott Myers in more effective C++, again, 90s, uh, to return the constructor arguments instead of objects. So what Scott Mayers here meant is that you shouldn't return named objects that you create in your function. You should return uh, basically an object directly. So you should return a, what's nowadays known as a PR value. He called it returning constructor arguments. And in modern syntax, it looks more or less like this, like you put curly braces and you, it really looks like returning just uh, the function, the constructor arguments. Now to test the hypothesis that it truly works and to show how it really works, I have two different test types or I prepared two different test types and they're quite different from each other. The first one is the trivial test type. It's a trivial string 
uh, which is some, I mean, it looks like a C structure almost, right? Uh, it has a length and as an array as a member. And uh, it's only trivial. It's also an aggregate. Uh, it's also oversized. So it's definitely bigger than what can be passed comfortably in the registers. Uh, what's worse about it, or the worst point, ab point about it, is despite the fact that it's trivial, it's also very expensive to move. Uh, or in fact, it's impossible to move. You cannot move it, it can be only copied, right? There is no really cheap move for it. So let's see how the compilers perform on a very simple task of returning such an object uh, or actually uh, an initialized a new variable with it. So I have a new variable, string variable, which I want to initialize with the return value, with the return object re returned by my colleague. Uh, now, compilers are smart here. So compilers, when they see this piece of code, will prepare a piece of stack which fits the string variable and pass the address of this object on the stack to the colleague, so to the red value. And uh, the colleague will directly initialize the return object in place uh, without any temporaries uh, on the way. Now, all compilers agree that object is created by the colleague directly on the stack at the target location. There is a full return value optimization full copiation. Now, uh, all compilers besides the Microsoft compiler, and uh, and it's really true. Now, MSVC does something else, and uh, it kind of, I mean, it's not shocking, but it's a bit weird. MSVC misses one of the optimizations. Uh, it creates two objects on the stack. One for the string variable, and that's correct. That's what the other compilers also did. But it also creates a temporary object, T1, and this is the place where the return value will go. So in a way, it does exactly what Michael mentioned in, in C++ Gems, right? It's, uh, it passes an address of, a, uh, uh, of the place where the temporary or where the return object should be created. As it should be, uh, as it should be done. Now the colleague uh, creates the object in this location because that's what it's told to do, and then returns to the caller. And unfortunately, the caller performs a full binary copy of it. Now this is expensive. Here it's not that expensive. It's only forty bytes, and using the uh, XM, uh, the MMX registers, it can be really done uh, very quickly. Uh, but it's expensive nevertheless. Imagine that this object was much bigger, like hundreds of bytes. It would take time. So the table which I'm going to build while, uh, while I talk looks like this. For a trivial object that's very expensive to go to move, and for a very simple case when I'm basically returning a PR value, all the compilers besides MSVC perform full copy slash move elision. There is nothing happening there uh, besides the last one. Now, the second test class that I'm using in this talk is a non-trivial test type. It's again a string and it's a kind of a string which you will teach to your students when you teach uh, the basics of, of C++. Uh, it's a dynamically allocated string, or it uses dynamic memory uh, allocation to allocate a car array. It also has a size inside, which you can see there, and it follows the rule of five, so there, there are all the special member functions are user-defined and perform a full copy assignment construction or move assignment construction, and there is also a destructor. Uh, so this is a non-trivial test type. It's not an aggregate. It's non-trivial but it's very cheap to move. It's only 16 bytes, and copying the 16 bytes is enough to move the object, right? Let's see how this one performs, or how the compilers perform on this object. Now, if I put the same code to the test as in the previous case, luckily, all the compilers do wonderfully. 
So all of them will, will create an object on the stack, a placeholder basically for our string variable, pass the address of it in the RDA or RCX register, and the colleague is going to directly create the object that, it's, uh, that it returns in place. So there is a full copy elision on all compilers, like really on all compilers. No questions asked, all of them perform exactly just like the standard dictates. Now, why is it possible? Uh, and how does it work under the hood? Because that's, that's a kind of a quite a curious story. Uh, using exactly the same scheme that I showed before, when I was told how our mental model looks like when we talk about returning something by value from a function, uh, basically in C++11 already, or even before C++11, uh, it worked like this. Some type temporary was created in the return statement or could have been created and then a copy or move of it was elided when creating the return object and one more time when initializing a variable. Notice that twice in this chain an object is initialized from the PR value. So some type this return object here is initialized from the PR value here and the object this variable here is initialized from the PR var that's returned by the function. So the copies could have been elided. Uh, under one condition, uh, that either the copy construct or the move constructor, which was elided, existed. So they had to be members of the class and they had to be accessible. Otherwise, the copy elision could, couldn't kick in. Uh, C17 introduced a change in it. In C17, uh, nothing is created at this place. Uh, the PR value that's there is just like you know, your ideal PR value. They're just hanging around and is automatically or passed to the next step in the chain. And uh, since there is no need really to create here an object, this PR value is again automatically forwarded one step further and here at this moment it materializes into the object and this object is then created with this PR value. Now this is called this mechanism is called the delayed temporary materialization. So the temporary is our PR value and it gets materialized only at the end of the chain. This is also mandatory in C17. C17 mandates then in those two cases copy elision slash move elision is mandatory. So when the object uh, when a return object is initialized from a PR value or when an object, uh, when a new variable is initialized from a PR value like this, copy elision is mandatory, which was before only optional in C11. Uh, another change is in C17, the copy and move constructors don't have to be there. So even for objects that don't have a copy or a move constructor, copy elision can kick in. Uh, in both cases, actually, any side effects of the copy or move constructor, if it's there, are ignored. Now, which leads to the next question. What happens in cases that are not mandated by the standard? Uh, you know, C17 requires a copy elision in this case, specific case. But what happens when we go a step further? So when instead of returning or creating the return object directly from a PR value, uh, we have a named object in the function. Well, it's an L value, right? And we are returning it. It's a different story. Now, it's totally optional to elide any copy or move in this case in C17. Uh, if it happens, side effects can be ignored, but it's optional to actually align the copies. So let's put those to the test. And to simulate somehow, or to be able to show how it can work, I came up with this kind of a nice function. Uh, there is a named object inside. It's a result object, 
just for simplicity, I called it result. And then introduced a bit of randomness into the process. So depending on the random outcome, and of course, talking, we are not talking about how random the standard round is here. It doesn't really matter. It's still random for the purpose of this talk, or random enough. We might assign another value to the result. And as an extra challenge, there are two return statements in the function. So we don't return trust in one place, there are two return statements. The rest doesn't really change. So I still initialize my string uh, variable directly from the value, from the object returned by the red value function. Now, this was also identified as an issue many years ago. And uh, Michael Tima in his article, uh, which was published or republished in C++ Gems, already mentioned that a really smart compiler could notice that result was only feeding the return value and see through it and optimize it away. Uh, he also proposed another solution which never cut it to the language or made it through to the language, which was extending the language by basically annotating your function with like an uh, what looks like an extra return statement uh, that tell the compiler which variable you intend intend to return. So which variable is going to be used as your return value? Uh, now we don't have it, uh, but we have something else. And the good news is that some compilers do agree. Uh, on some compilers, at least on Clang and GCC, we get a full copy elision. So even in this difficult case, the address or the string is created on the stack and the address of it is passed to the colli. And the colli is able to directly create an object in place. And this is even for this non-trivial, you know, red value function, which has an L value inside. Everything just happens in the place pointed to uh, by the caller. Now, ICC and MSVC do something else, uh, like totally something else. Uh, what ICC does, so the Intel compiler is this. It begins exactly like Clang or GC. So it creates a string variable, the stack, puts the address of it as a return object address into the RDI register and calls the colli, calls the red value function. Now the red value function actually creates another variable, uh, an L, L value on the stack. Uh, it populates it with something depending on the random outcome. And then at the end, because it was passed the address of the return object, it makes a full copy of it. So it copies from the result to the string and that's the end. Uh, MSVC does actually steps up a game a bit. Let's call it like this. MSVC does the following. It creates a string variable on the stack. It's empty in the beginning, nothing's there. It also creates a temporary for the return object for the colli and passes the address of this temporary to the colli, to the red value function. Now, the colli creates one more variable, the result variable, which was declared within the function and, you know, initializes it, changes its value depending on the random outcome. And then when it decided that it's the end of the story, it copies the value of the result into the temporary location into the temporary object and of course returns the address of this temporary in the array x register now when the function returns to the caller it makes one more copy it copies the object object from the temporary back to the str to the string variable so in total there are two copies from the MS msvc and one copy for the icc whereas gcc and clank manage to fully avoid anything uh, is this a difference? Yes, it's a huge difference. It's for bigger object, it can be, you know, a deal breaker, whether you make a copy here or not make a copy. Uh, at least two compilers now that are now on market perform very well, two of them a bit worse, let's say. 
And again, this is not mandatory, right? So remember this copy elision wasn't mandatory, so uh, it could have happened. Now, the next one is using the proper string with the same scenario. So my toy string, uh, which is non-trivial, but very cheap to move. And let's see how this one goes. Now, in the beginning, we initialize as usually the placeholder for the string variable and we put the address or the compiler puts the address of the string variable into the RDI register. Now, next, the colleague fills in the place and allocates a piece of memory in the process because it holds a dynamic resource and everything seems to be well wired together. Now, at least for Clang GC and ICC, all of them agree the copy is fully alighted. There is no copy, no move whatsoever. So the object is created directly in place uh, on the color uh, or basically on the where it should belong to. Uh, anything that happens in between, so even if a memory needs to be destroyed in the process, uh, in the red value function, it's not visible to the caller. Now, MSVC disagrees on this approach. MSVC does something that's already hinted in the previous case when I was talking about the trivial string. Uh, it introduces a string variable first on the stack, passes it, the address of it, in the register. Now, the function the Coli creates a new object, the result object uh, on the stack and also partially on the heap because you know it needs to allocate it uh, and then makes a copy of it. Uh, but you know it's actually a bit smarter. It's uh, I call it a copy because what it truly does is a move construction, but it omits pieces of this move construction. Uh, so it ignores pieces of it, uh, knowing that the stack where the result resides is never going to be used again so it doesn't have to zero for example or assign a null pointer to the string uh, of the result but nevertheless it you know formally it moves constructs the string from the result uh, and the copy is aligned and actually that's pretty good you know that's exactly what should happen in this case uh, there is only one move construction in this whole chain and nothing else uh, so pretty well if you ask me uh, it's a cheap object you know 16 bytes doesn't really matter uh, so that's how it looks like and uh, let's let's basically call it differently i before had trivial non-trivial but what i really mean is something that's cheaply movable and something that's uh, very expensive to move or basically move is equal to a copy and uh, where a binary representation of an object can be actually copied also to create a new object so you don't need a copy constructor or a copy assignment operator to create a copy just a binary copy is enough which is not the case for the uh, non-trivial string here and that's also instead of having the a full annotation would just you know focus on how many copies are performed or moves and as you can see two compilers perform very well on both tasks on actually all four different tasks they manage to alight all the copies and all the moves icc is performing reasonably well msvc is performing not that great especially for the object that is not cheap to move it always creates a full binary copy uh, at least one sometimes even twice now that being said let's step up the game uh, we can do something much more fancy uh, instead of what i had before so instead of just returning an object from a function and constructing a new object direct from the return value uh, we can do this so there is a function which is exactly the same as before. It just creates a string and returns it. Uh, but now, instead of 
creating the string from the value returned by the function, we assign the return value to an already existing variable. It's an assignment, it's not a construction. Uh, and actually this is, you know, a totally different case. Uh, it's not mandated by the standard that a copy is elided there. Actually, it's super difficult to elide a copy there because how can you, you know, not copy? So let's see what the compilers have to say about this assignment and if they are able to optimize something away. Now, something, uh, when I started doing this, this investigation, actually, uh, I started with, uh, with making this kind of a table. So this is what I expected based on the results on the, or of the investigation so far. Uh, I expected that for the trivial objects, for, so for the not that, uh, for the expensive to move object, uh, there will be a full copy construction for all the compilers and for the cheaply movable object there will be a move uh, sorry uh, copy assignment and for the cheaply movable uh, object there will be a move assignment uh, when I do this one and this is just impossible to avoid. Uh, I also expected that MSVC is going to be doing a bit worse and it will be creating an unnecessary copy or an unnecessary move uh, for the case when I'm returning an L value, so when, when I return a named object. Now, the reality uh, was quite surprising. Uh, that's roughly the reality. Uh, as you will see, some compilers managed to avoid a lot or managed to avoid moves and copies in places when you wouldn't expect it. And the first one, which is super surprising, is this one. So GCC and ICC for a trivial object, which is very expensive to move, fully manage to avoid any copy or move when there is an assignment. Now, how do they do it? It starts with this one, right? So the trivial string needs to be constructed and it has a value. And then a magic happens. Instead of creating like another object or another placeholder for a return value, those compilers do pass the address of the already existing variable and already existing object the function to the red value, which in turn constructs the new object at the target location. So both compilers are actually able to three through the mist notice that this is a trivial object. It doesn't have a user defined special member function and that making a binary copy, so just, you know, think the bits, is enough to create a new instance. There is no destructor call, nothing like this. They don't have to worry about it. So just overwriting the old values and we are good to go, right? That's what they do and that works wonderfully. So it surprised me a bit. And what surprised me even more are those things. And notice that I, how I mark it on this, uh, in this table is a check mark slash move assignment because it's kind of both. It depends heavily on the conditions. And I must say GCC is a bit better with it. So GCC is a bit more uh, advanced or when it comes to, or I wouldn't say advanced, but it's, it can see through the mist again better than Clang and optimize away a bit more. Uh, also when this object is a bit bigger because I also did experiments with a bit bigger uh, non-trivial object where it had some, you know, uh, big storage inside, uh, uh, just uh, in terms of a, an array member variable. Uh, nevertheless, how do they do it? Uh, and I, I must say that the code that you are seeing on the slides is a simplified version of the code that I was using. Uh, here it's a piece of reality as an extra challenge after instantiating an object, a string object, there is a print statement uh, which prints the string 
uh, so I am sure that the compiler doesn't optimize too many things away and only then there is an assignment. So how do GCC and Clang actually approach this problem? Now, both of them do first create an object and they, you know, create them in a usual way, uh, allocating the space and passing the address of it in the uh, RDI register to the colleague. Notice that the object is already fully constructed, right? It's something there. It's also an object that manages a dynamic resource. So there is a destructor call. And now, you know, you, the, there's a bit of a confusion coming, like how can it work? Uh, because when the colleague overrides the stack, uh, then the, co the program won't be able to delete the old resource, right? Now, luckily, those compilers are pretty smart and save the address of the dynamic resource, so the piece of the memory block on the heap in the RBX or the RBP register, depending on the compiler. For Clank, it's RBX. Now, to be honest, actually, there is nothing on the stack. Uh, this stack is empty in the beginning and anything that's there is actually this RBX register. Even the size is optimized away and 18 doesn't even appear in the program so far. So now you can see it's quite easy for the colleague to create an object in this place. The colleague just simply can create an object, populate the stack, fill it in with a pointer or whatever it wants, whatever it fits uh, proper at this uh, at this moment, and when a colleague returns after creating the object, uh, the caller simply frees the memory block previously allocated at the first line, so previously allocated for the object that existed. And this is, I must say, pretty cool. Uh, and I'm going to show something that Clang does. Uh, GCC does it a, a, in a bit, uh, let's say, uh, less obvious way, but what Clang does, I mean, officially there is a move assignment somewhere there, right? And the move assignment is implemented in this very classic way uh, with the comparison of pointers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, leaving the moved from object in the valid uh, state. Uh, now, what Clang does is actually ignores mode of most of the move constructor. It's not even there. The delete part of the move, move constructor goes to the caller, so the caller is responsible for deleting the old resource. Uh, this piece is actually done by the red val function. It assigns the new values, new proper values to the string object, and the rest of it is not even there. So there is no zeroing of, of of the moved from object, nothing like this. GCC doesn't omit those, but Clang does. Um, as a comparison, ICC does everything. It even uses the if this is not other comparison inside. But this is uh, Clang optimizes everything away. That's all what's left out of the move assignment operator. And this is pretty amazing, if you ask me. This just shows how good the optimizing compilers are. Even for this non-trivial case, fairly complex scenario, they're able to basically, you know, remove 80% of the work out of the machine code. So to sum it up, uh, that's where we are now. Uh, for assigning uh, or a return object, to an already existing variable. That's how our table will look like. Uh, generally speaking, it's much worse when we, uh, than previously, and that's to be expected. It's a much more complex scenario. However, GCC is doing remarkably well on these test cases. It manages to optimize fully any copy or any move almost in all the scenarios. And Clank is, Clank is like uh, on the second place, doing actually also very well. And I was particularly impressed by how it optimized away uh, the code that was not uh, needed or not used.
uh, with the usual third and the fourth place, uh, as in the previous case, ICC and MSVC. And uh, MSVC again does make two copies uh, in the same case as previously. So when I was returning an L value, and this time it's also making two times a move of an object for a non-trivial object when I'm uh, returning an L value. Previously, it was doing just one move. Uh, so that's how it works. And up till now, what we've talked about, what I've shown is that copy and move elision is uh, guaranteed since C17 for PR values, uh, but it doesn't always happen. MSVC doesn't do it in, in one specific case when it should be doing it. Uh, at least that's what I've seen in the testing that I've done. And I still have like a small suspicion that maybe I've done something wrong. Uh, sometimes copy and move elision works also for L values. So when you return an L value from a function, uh, some compilers manage to elide it then. And surprisingly, sometimes even the whole chains of copies and moves can be eliminated uh, with multiple assignments on the way, uh, which is unbelievable. Now, which leads to the second part and a, a bit shorter part of this talk, passing by value. Uh, what do we mean when we pass by value? Well, I guess something like this, right? We create an object uh, of some type, and then we just, you know, prompt it into the function call. And this function is taking a value. So what happens? A full copy of an object is made. That's how we think about it, right? And I must say, uh, here we kind of have no choice. No, this object exists there uh, somewhere. We cannot automatically move it or, or propagate a PR value or whatever. This object is there. It might be used later on. We cannot just discard it. We have to make a copy. And the compilers do agree. Actually, not so surprisingly, Compilers do agree. Uh, for example, when we pass a non-trivial object, the proper string by value, uh, what does happen? Well, a string is created uh, on the stack with a dynamic, dynamic piece of resource allocated uh, together with it. Uh, then in the next step, when the by value is called and the string is passed on, as an argument, a copy of it uh, is created for the argument, a full copy uh, the copy constructor, and the address of the argument is passed to the colleague. And there is no way around it. All the compilers, like really all the compilers fully agree, there is a constructor and a copy constructor, two times new, two times delete. No way around it. Now the curious things start to happen when we have, when we have our trivial string. So the thing uh, which actually, you know, a full binary representation is already uh, a full object. Uh, so when you instantiate or when you copy an object, it's enough to copy the bytes. You don't have to do anything else, right? It's a trivial object. Uh, also not that easy to move. Uh, so what do the compilers do? I mean, typically they do something like this. Uh, we instantiate, we create a new variable. It's a string variable. Uh, then we make a copy of it on the stack. It's a big oversized object. It's going to appear on the stack. Uh, and then we call the function and we pass the address. Uh, actually, we don't pass the address. Sorry, it's on the stack. So we don't even pass the address. Uh, the, the function just knows that the object is on the stack and it's going to call the printf uh, by passing the right pointer to the printf function. And at least this is what GCC and MSVC do. Now, Clank and ICC take a different approach. And this was, again, something that surprised me a lot. Now, Clank and ICC uh, see through the fingers. So they notice that actually this object is passed there and not really changed. So what they do is create an object on the stack the string object on the stack, and then they call, call by value 
without creating a copy. And you know that by value, is it sees the stack, it sees the object on the stack, and it simply uses the already existing object to print the string uh, using the printf function and returns uh, to the caller. So there is no copy being made whatsoever when you pass by value in this case. It truly does happen for Clank and ICC. Uh, with a small trap, uh, if you don't have this line in between. If there is anything between the object creation and calling the function, a copy will be made. No way around it. And this is super surprising, and I will tell you why it's so surprising. I'm only printing the length of this string. It's 22, right? You can see it, the number 22 is there on the screen. So when I'm not printing this thing, when I this line is removed, uh, the code that is emitted by the compilers, by both uh, compilers, and this is actually an optimized code already uh, with some of the things, uh, no, it's not optimized, sorry, it's not inlined. So what happens is uh, there is a place created on the stack, 40 bytes, because this is the size of the string, and these 40 bytes get initialized uh, with just a constant value that I passed in the constructor. Uh, and then the by value is called. So this is what happens when there is no printf. So you might think, how does printf disturb this kind of uh, optimization that there is no copy? And I must tell you, I have no idea. Because if the printf is added there, the compiler rearranges the code. And what it will do is something like this. There will be still a part where the string is created and when the copy of string, so the argument is created on the stack, there will be still the part when the by value is called and that's the bottom part. Now, before all this happens, there is a call to the printf. But this call uses a constant 22. So the compiler could see that 22 is there. It's a constant, it's just a number. Calls printf even before anything is created with the number 22 passed as an argument to the printf function and only then starts creating the string and making a copy of a string as an argument. And this is, you know, super surprising that the compiler uh, wasn't able to optimize away a copy when it was able to do it, uh, when the printf wasn't there. It totally doesn't influence it. Nevertheless, that's what happens. So what do we learn from it? Uh, when you have to sum it up, or when I have to sum it up, that neither passing nor returning by value means always making a copy. And surprisingly, not even passing by value means making a copy, because the compilers aggressively avoid copies and moves. And when it comes to returning, it's, it's really crazy. I didn't expect it that it happens in, to such an extent nowadays. Uh, another takeaway is, instead of benchmarking, sometimes look at the machine code that's generated because there are hidden gems there. And you know, you might get insight that sometimes just removing a line of code like this printf statement uh, that I've shown you a moment ago might save you a lot of overhead. So be careful what you're doing in what order you're doing it. Uh, compilers sometimes do crazy and surprising optimizations. Now, to close this talk, uh, you know, I want to just show you one more thing. Uh, as I said, there are so many ways to pass something to a function. I've talked extensively about value passing. So it, the talk was about compilers, values, right? And functions. Uh, instead of passing by value, you can of course pass by a reference, by an R value reference, or by a pointer, 
uh, be it a constant pointer or a non-constant pointer, whatever it is. In all of those cases, a compiler will generate exactly the same code. So from the point of view of the compiler, all those functions look exactly the same. It doesn't matter how you pass. What you do pass is a pointer to an object on the stack, most likely in this case, in the RDI register. And that's all. Nothing else, nothing more. So in the end, all non-trivial objects which need a special user-defined special member function will be passed by a pointer. And uh, that concludes my talk. So thanks for listening and it's time for the answers. So I will shift if I manage to. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I think we have five more minutes before Hubido kicks us out of that stream. So if there are any questions we haven't answered, uh, he, uh, David hasn't answered until then, I think he will be available on the tables for further questions, right? Yes. Okay, um, uh, can you see the Q&A tab or should I read the question? I'm not switching to the Q&A. And I can see there are questions, so I'm going to read them through, okay. starting well, with the first one. Uh, Matthias Kilat, uh, what happens if the copy constructor would perform side effects? This is probably bad style from a programmer point of view. Uh, if it comes to returning something, or basically when you are creating a new object from a PR value, or you return uh, a PR value as a part of your return statement, then the compilers are allowed to ignore any side effects. And they do ignore any side effects. Uh, when you pass something to a function by value, then yeah, copy constructor will be called anyway because it's not allowed, uh, you're not allowed to optimize it. Uh, unless you pass a PR value, and then I guess, uh, I don't guess, I do remember, as far as I remember, uh, it can be again ignored. Uh, yes, there is a specific reason for printf. Uh, I was analyzing lots of assembly code and believe me, uh, honey or not, it's it's much, much easier to understand how printf works than a cout stream uh, when you look at the uh, assembly generated. So uh, that's the reason. Um, I used the newest version, so the newest release versions available. Uh, Thomas Keys, this is your question, which is C Clang version and so on. I used in the slides uh, the newest available release version on the uh, on the Compiler Explorer, so uh, Clang 13, uh, and the rest I forgot. Sorry. It's on the first slide also, so. Uh, yes, uh, that's a curious question. Uh, like, for example, if, uh, uh, okay, I will first read the question because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Uh, Dennis, uh, uh, your question. If some of the findings regarding MSVC might have changed, I could believe that yes. Uh, because I uh, not I, even today I read a discussion about it uh, that MSVC doesn't uh, because of the ABI actually that it has uh, the Windows the ABI that Windows uses uh, objects are not allowed for example to be passed in the registers uh, so they have to be passed on the stack which is always expensive uh, when compared to the registers and there are other quirks, quirks like this uh, when it comes to why MVC is making copies? I don't know. Uh, and I don't know, I hopefully, when the new compilers pop out, I will check it. I hope that they optimize it away, some of those copies. Uh, Dennis, sorry that your question uh, moved to the bottom. Uh, 
Uh, I don't remember what the Microsoft uses RDI and RS RSI. It uses uh, other registers by default. I guess that, you know, uh, when you design an ABI, it's, it's a trade-off. Uh, how much do you allocate to passing arguments and how much you allocate to be freely available uh, to, to do your calculations within a function, right? Uh, so I have no idea. I don't remember what they use it for. Uh, as far as I remember, the fast call star and, uh, and so on conventions do not apply anymore to the 64-bit uh, ABI of Microsoft. And the last question, did I intentionally, yes, uh, a bit intentionally, I, I didn't really want to talk about it. So MSVC, uh, yes, it's true, those functions differ in MSVC. Uh, and by value is really lengthy, so I, I omitted it uh, on purpose. And I think there are no more questions. So thanks again for listening to the talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I will still be, oh no, there is. I haven't seen it, Goran. Uh, not in the testing that I've done. In the testing that I've done uh, for objects that, I, I mean, you know, you have to also think about it. Uh, a bit what I was doing. As I said, one of the object was expensive to move. And I pretty much think, I, I don't think, I know that Microsoft or that, that the compilers, when Microsoft was, or Microsoft's compiler was making a copy, it was actually moving the object. But because the move of this object defaults to a copy, uh, there was no optimization of it. Uh, so it was trivial, but nevertheless, a full binary copy of it had to be made. And since it's, you know, it was 40 bytes, uh, so unfortunately it was there. Uh, and you could see it when, for a non-trivial type, uh, it was actually optimizing away. On the other hand, not always, right? So sometimes it was making a copy, uh, nevertheless, uh, which was also actually, I think, a move under the hood. Uh, but it just looked like a copy. So it performs it, but it does it a bit worse because it always explicitly moves slash copies an object instead of just constructing it, constructing it in place. So both Clang, GC, and IC are a step ahead. They pass the address uh, of the variable that they want to create from the return object. And, you know, it's directly created there instead of being moved there or copied there. Uh, I think there are all the questions uh, so far. So thanks again for hanging around with me and listening to the talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I will still be at the table for a couple of minutes and uh, thank you all. Uh, have a nice conference.